Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our webinar today on getting started with qualitative focused uh, mixed methods research, or MMR for short. So this is part of the qualitative research and innovation webinar series that's presented by Invivo and Sage Publishing. Uh, before I introduce our guests today, I just want to go through some of the features of um, GoToWebinar. So everyone is on mute, just so it's easier for you to hear us. Uh, this is being recorded, so you'll get a copy of the recording a few days after the webinar. Um, also, in the handout area, there's, um, so if you go to the top uh, right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see an orange box with a white arrow. If you click on the white arrow, it opens up the menu. So you'll see a handout section. Um, that's the PowerPoint slide, so feel free to download those um, if you'd like. And also, um, if you have questions at any time, feel free in the question area to type in a question. Um, and we'll be taking questions throughout, but um, we'll, there'll be certain times where we, uh, where Cheryl will answer the questions. We'll also be doing some polls, so those will come up and you'll see those, so please um, participate because I'll make uh, it a little, a little bit more interactive. So now I'm just going to um, uh, formally introduce myself. I am Stacy Penna, the Invivo Community Director here at QSR, and at the end I'll talk a little bit more about the community and how you can get involved, uh, but I also want um, my co-host, um, Ali, to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Ali Owen, joining you from London. Uh, I'm the commissioning editor at SAGE for Research Methods Books, and I work primarily on books, but kind of work in all digital projects around them, and really excited to be a part of this series. I will also talk a bit more about Cheryl and some of her other books with us, if you're interested in learning more at the end of the presentation. Great, thank you, Ali. And for our guest of honor, uh, Dr. Cheryl Poth, who's a professor and award-winning instructor and author at the University of Alberta. Um, she is a past president of the Mixed Methods International Research Association and author of Innovation in Mixed Methods Research, published in 2018 by SAGE um, and co-authored by John Cresswell of Qualitative Inquiry and Research Design. Um, also written, uh, written, that was written with John Cresswell um, uh, also published by SAGE. So Cheryl, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Well, many thanks for the intro, both of you, Stacey and, and Ali. And I'm really happy to be here with you today. I'm also just thrilled that so many uh, folks have joined us. So that is, um, that is wonderful. So what I wanted to do in this webinar is I wanted to introduce a little bit more about qualitative focused uh, mixed methods research. It, it's an area that in my view is actually under discussed. And there are many ways I could have organized this talk, but I've chosen to focus on four essential things to know and do related to the why, the what, the who, and the how. And so these are just four pieces of the mixed methods research puzzle, but more than a decade of experience as a mixed methods researcher, author, reviewer, and instructor tell me that these are key areas that help researchers to differentiate mixed methods research from your other experiences. So by using these as our focal points today, we can further explore these areas specific to the qualitative focused um, mixed methods research. So if you can go to the next one, that would be great. Um, one of the uh, challenges that we see in the literature is that we don't always refer to, to the many of these designs as qualitative focused mixed methods research. And indeed, in my own illustrative examples, um, it's, it's a little bit more subtle than it is actually talking about them explicitly. So I have chosen two illustrative examples. I've given the, um, the, the websites where they can be downloaded. They are open access because I know not everybody has the same uh, to make it easy for everybody. You don't have to know them uh, in terms of this, but I wanted you to have them on hand for you can look at them afterwards um, if you'd like. So these are both, uh, and I will also include some additional references to help you get started, because I think it's important that you see this as a launch pad for where you can kind of go next. So if we can get to the next one. Uh, in my approach to this webinar, I find the most impactful learning happens. And I recently listened to a webinar last week um, and we're always kind of changing up the different ways that we do it, is that I want you to be actively engaged. I would like you to be able to connect with your own experiences. I hope that you can take risks and think creatively. And so some of the ways you can engage with this is as Stacey, we're gonna have two polls and uh, 
uh, in just a moment, we will have our first poll. And uh, I'm going to have a few sections that is now is your turn. So if you have a piece of paper handy, um, I use a whiteboard in all of my workspaces. I have whiteboards that I scratch different ideas down. Um, and even this morning, I was just telling Ali that I was that I was doing a little bit of work uh, that way in terms of scratching down an idea. So if you can have a piece of paper handy, uh, even during this webinar, then I think that that could be helpful. Uh, and also, again, as I mentioned, that, that there will be some, some moments for asking questions. So uh, please don't be shy. And we won't get maybe to everybody's question, but we can certainly uh, start that. So to help me uh, get us started, uh, let's, um, let's have our first poll now, if we can. And so please choose the option that best describes you today. The first one is A, I am a newcomer to both mixed methods research and qualitative research. B, I am a newcomer to mixed methods research and bring some or a lot of qualitative research experience. C, I bring some a lot of mixed methods experience and I'm a newcomer to uh, qualitative research. And then D, I bring some a lot of both uh, mixed methods research and qualitative research. So this kind of helps me to know who's, um, who's coming in, uh, in, in here. And we're going to talk about why that matters uh, for this webinar. I'll give you a chance just to decide. Yeah, so people are doing that now, Cheryl, and I, I'm not yeah. sure if you can see the results. So if you can't, I can read them off. Yeah, I can't. So that would be great. Okay. <laughs> so we almost have full participation. Super. So I think, um, so we have 38% uh, with A, 38% mm -hmm. B, <laughs> and 8% C, and 16% D. Okay, awesome. That's great. So if you can go to the next slide then. Okay, I'm just going to close the poll. Yep, and so, yep, and so just the next one will be super. So if you look at that, so what you just told me is we have 38% that are newcomer to both. And that's great, because what that means is perhaps you have experiences in other uh, things and that you, you're just trying to kind of figure out. Mixed, the, the, the qualitative focus mixed methods is a great entree to both mixed methods and even qualitative research. So, uh, so that's a great, a great way. Uh, we had 38% as well with higher qualitative and lower mixed methods, and that makes total sense as well because I find that 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 um, so much of this is familiar to folks who are doing qualitative. Uh, but then what I, what I want to focus on today is some of the things that you want to be thinking about. That maybe you don't have to think about as much in qualitative and make that kind of connection. And then 8% is higher mixed methods, and I'm not surprised by that at all. Um, there actually are not a lot of folks who would actually even say that they have a higher level of mixed methods um, research. And so that is just fine. And then the, and then the, the last one, which is also fantastic, 16% said you have a fair bit of both. And that uh, as well is one of the things that has brought me to kind of be interested in this area, is when you build, actually working on on, on qualitative focused mixed methods helps you actually build and even unpack some of the things maybe that you are, are further developing. And so by working in this area, I've actually developed some of my qualitative skills in perhaps different approaches that I've, that I've been doing. So welcome to everybody, so happy to have you here. Uh, if we can, so we'll go to the next one. So that's why the, the, that's important. And as qualitative researchers, we, we have to think about what brought us here today. So have you ever considered the path? So this is, uh, I love this picture. I think it's a beautiful picture of uh, when I had snow this morning, uh, I'm happy to see the, the nice warm weather in this. And this really curvy um, roadside reminds me, and even I, I joke that sometimes I feel like um, my path has been even, you know, circles, you know, and kind of moving ahead a little bit like a human circle. So if I can, um, one more click, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll, we'll bring up. As researchers, and, and particularly qualitative researchers, we are influenced by many, many things and mixed methods. And so in just a second, I want to describe a few of the influences for me, and then I'm going to ask you to think about what have been your key influences. All right. If you can, Stacey. Yep. Yeah. So my path has been wonderfully emergent. Uh, I didn't, um, you know, 20 years ago, um, I would not have been able to guess that I would be here where I am. And I think sometimes we have to be thinking about serendipity. And, and, and even especially right now with some of the uncertainty that we're all dealing with around the world. And some of the key influences um, for me have involved the opportunities I've had as a mixed methods instructor. When I came to the U of A in, in 2008, I noticed a gap. 
on my campus of 36,000 students, that there was no mixed methods. And so even though I had never taken a mixed methods course myself, I talk about myself as a first generation mixed methods instructor, that I took, if I can, the risk even to put and develop. And, uh, and since that time in the past 10 years, whenever I offer the, the mixed methods uh, course, it is always oversubscribed. So I can't keep up with demand. And by doing that, I've created a really nice niche for myself on my campus. And I get the chance to interact with students from all over campus, even though I am based in education. So that's been a really neat, uh, unexpected, if I can, ripple effect. I've worked with mentors in the areas of qualitative research. You, you heard about, uh, um, you know, I, I actually met John Cresswell in a workshop, my first workshop on mixed methods research uh, back in the early 2000s. And so that actually led to, to more work in actually even qualitative research. So you never know who you're going to meet and where. I've had wonderful mentors in mixed methods research. You can see on the um, left-hand side that uh, I um, did an international journal of qualitative methods. Uh, Tony Onwegbuzi and I did two um, issues on, on focus on mixed methods in that. And it was interesting. What, what took me to there is I invited him then to be a keynote at a conference. But it was because I had submitted a article very early in my career to a, an issue of a journal that he had uh, been um, a guest editor. And I had such a good learning experience as a beginning professor that I wanted to learn how to do special issues from somebody who knew how to do it. So those are the kinds of things that you can think about it. In program evaluation, you wouldn't see maybe the connections between mixed methods and program evaluation. But what happened to me is that early in my career, as I was being told by my university or by my uh, mentors that you should really pick a pick a lane, uh, you know, pick a qualitative, pick a mixed methods or pick a quantitative lane. And I said, well, I kind of like the way that 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 my different worlds intersect. And what happened with program evaluation is I encountered a lot of folks like Jennifer Green who are working in both program evaluation and mixed methods research. So it actually told me that I was on the right path. The Burke Johnsons, the, you know, all the different people that I would meet um, in both of these conferences. And then I got involved in these special interest groups. So that's how you kind of got to know folks. So I tell you that because sometimes we don't know kind of how to enter, um, you know, different fields or how to find, if, if I can, the people that we can learn from. As an author, as an editorial and reviewer roles, so I'm still involved in the International Journal of Qualitative Methods as, a, as an editorial board member, and I'm also an associate editor of the Journal of Mixed Methods. That keeps me um, in tune with what's going on in the field and new emerging and seeing gaps. The other thing I do is I do a lot of work on grant uh, funding uh, reviews. Um, in Canada, at the federal level, I do it at my university, I do it because part of the peer review process is actually being um, open to the different ways that folks can do their research. And so I have found that I've played a really big, if I can, educating role about both mixed methods and about qualitative focused mixed methods designs to the folks who are also on these committees with me. So remembering those. Um, by doing workshops all over the world uh, and teaching workshops, I get a chance to meet uh, in normal circumstances um, and, and get reminded about where the different fields are at um, all over the world. And also, don't forget that your professional association roles are really important. Um, I think um, Stacy had mentioned that I've, I've served as president of the Mixed Methods International Research Association. I was part of the founding group um, who, who, who brought that to bear, and that's a wonderful way. One of the things that we're working on right now is, um, is I'm working as an editor of, the, of a SAGE handbook on mixed methods designs, and there will be a number of qualitative focused mixed methods design chapters. So I'm really excited about that as well. So uh, I hope that that gives you a sense of, of, of kind of where I'm coming from and the different ways that, you know, my, my life has dovetailed um, across qualitative and also mixed methods. Thanks, Stacey. So now it's your turn. Uh, if you can, let's take a pause for, for two minutes and write down what have been some key influences on your thinking methods and practices. And think about why does it matter about what we bring when we're talking about these things. So I'll just pause here for a moment.
silence is hard sometimes, isn't it? Cheryl, just to let you know, it's Ali speaking. We do have some questions and comments oh. coming in. So let us know when you'd like to go through some of those. Sure. Uh, so if I can, uh, are there some general, um, maybe I can take one now as folks are, are, are maybe half listening and half writing? Uh, sure. Um, there's one general one about just more of a basic definition about what you understand as mixed methods research. Awesome. We're coming up to that. Okay. Yep. Then skipping to a different one that might not be covered later. Um, can the mix be between different qualitative methods and no quantitative at all? Fabulous. Great, great question. And so that's going to, we're going to get into the definition of mixed methods. And so one of the things that I'd like to mention is that there is no consensus um, on mixed methods. There's a great handbook um, even by Oxford called the Multi-Method and Mixed Methods Handbook. And that is a handbook that has actually tackled this a little bit. There's a great um, article by Jennifer Green in that handbook. And it talks about the importance of perhaps keeping mixed methods um, as the term to talk about the interface between qualitative and quantitative, where multi-method um, could be multiple qualitative sources together. So that's where I'm going to put my feet down um, here in terms of that. I think that di that distinguishing feature is actually important. Um, but I also think it's very important to have you know multiple um, qualitative data sources um, if that's the way that 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 that's where you want to take it. So um, again, there are folks who use mixed methods interchangeably, um, but the vast majority of folks working in mixed methods research do talk about mixed methods as being, um, you know, including both qualitative and quantitative. Now, what's neat about uh, qualitative focus is it does allow you to bring all the qualitative and then bring in some of the different pieces of quantitative. The other discussion that I think is really interesting and it's and it's continuing is boy, does the dichotomy of qualitative and quantitative data still hold when we think about all the different, if I can, forms of data? So I imagine, and there are people who have talked about this before me from, uh, you know, from Pat Baisley to, um, you know, lots of different people have, have, been, have been talking about this, is I envision a future where we might not be talking about qual and quad um, quite so much. And so I look forward to that as well. So let's go, let's go into our first one because this is our first question is going to, um, great. And so why is integration of qualitative and quantitative research needed for your mixed method study? And so what I am saying and, and others are saying is that integration is a core characteristic of mixed methods research. Now, and so the definition, so uh, although we, we might not have a definition that, that we all agree on, there is some consensus about these four core characteristics that were advanced by John and Vicki Plato Clark in their third edition of the Mixed Methods um, uh, textbook. And so this does stipulate that it collects and analyzes both qualitative and quantitative data. And I love that they've added rigorously um, because I think that that is important. And it is also a connection to research questions. So like everything, it comes down to the research question do you require, is there a need for integration? The second core is it integrates, or if you would prefer, mixes or combines the two forms of data and the results. Now, I do think it's important that there could be multiple data sources, but that in your, in your mix of multiple data sources, you would have some qualitative and some quantitative. Now, in this qualitative focus, you might have mostly qualitative. You might be using, um, you know, you might transform some of your qualitative to be quantitative. And so uh, that, is, that is really important. The third core um, characteristic is that it organizes these procedures into specific research designs that provide the logic for conducting the study. So remembering that this is coming from the mixed methods research field. And in just a moment, I'm going to introduce how I see these core characteristics, um, if I can, being influenced by the qualitative focus piece. And then again, I love the fact that, that we're now talking about that designs are influenced by theory and philosophy. So let's stay here for a moment in kind of the mixed methods world, and then I'm going to come back into where they interface. Okay, Stacey. In practice, 
the way that we ask researchers to do this then is that they identify a mixing purpose for their mixed method study. And so I've listed four, you know, a very common uh, ones that I talk about in my, in, in, in my book as well, and that these are only examples. Please know that there's lots of others. And so when we talk about what will integration offer your study is we can think about things like corroboration. So when either qualitative or quantitative data is insufficient to kind of make your case. So perhaps um, perhaps you've used a measure in, 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 in quantitative that you know isn't current. And so you can use that qualitative piece to maybe even um, in the development to even you know increase um, or um, bring update the 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 scale of the measure. In explanation, we might have this idea about uh, that we see we see either trends in qualitative or in quantitative that require some sort of explaining using the other. Um, often, if we start with qualitative and we follow up with a quantitative, then we might be want maybe our our um, our goal is to generalize. If we're starting with a quantitative and we see some 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 trends in the quantitative, and perhaps we want to even find a particular population to study um, using qualitative, then we might use uh, you know again that idea of explanation, and then completion. See, the difference for me between corroboration and completion is I think about completion as being uh, like a jigsaw puzzle. Like I can I can see maybe the outer you know frames of it, but maybe the uh, you know with the quantitative trends, but maybe the you know we talk about putting you know the contextual understandings um, in there, and so that's when uh, additional data. So you notice here where I'm talking here, this is not qualitative focus. This is just from the mixed methods um, uh, literature. So now let's let's now talk uh, a little bit more focused in the qualitative. Yep. So here's where I took those four uh, core um, characteristics from mixed methods, and I combined it with the thinking. And, and I want to acknowledge uh, Charlene Hesse Viber has done some great work in this area. This she's a chapter in in in, in this book that I that I list on the resource list that I love. Uh, that is, and she talks about qualitative driven. Uh, mixed methods research, which is which is fine, but this is where this differs. So this is where when you when you talk about in the first char core characteristic, it actually privileges the subjective experiences, and that's what more qualitative, um, you know. And you can take this in lots of different places. This this that you know. Please feel free to always adapt this. Um, and but it is that idea about 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 bringing in, and that's what we're going to, if I can, focus on or prioritize, privilege, whatever word you want to use. Uh, the second core characteristic then talks about that we're, the types of integration of, of data is that we want to generate insights that seek you know, to empower individual stories with the goal of understanding how they make meaning within the social world. Now this, if you're coming from a qualitative perspective, this is more of a constructivist uh, kind of perspective, which is probably where I put my feet. So if this is not um, as useful for you, feel free to adapt this. And then in the third one, I talk about organizing the procedures into design descriptions, because I'm not sure uh, enough designs and enough, um, if I can, enough um, typologies that are qualitative focus and enough guidance exists yet. So I think there's actually a really lovely opportunity for all of us to be contributing to this area. And again, where I love where, where this interface is really nicely is that we see lots of great places where in qualitative research theory plays a, a, a much bigger or more prominent role than, than sometimes in either mixed methods or often also in, in quantitative. So this is where we're kind of finding, if I can, that, 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 that interface. All right. And then, so this is, like I kind of explained that you might see these different qualitatively driven, led, prioritized. I prefer focus, but that's, uh, sometimes I talk about the world according to Cheryl, um, but that you may very well need to also search the literature for qualitative driven. Yep. And so in practice, qualitative researchers also need to identify a mixing purpose, but these mixing purposes will look a little different than, than, than what we see in the more general area of mixed methods. So let's say um, corroboration, uh, that you might want to provide additional perspectives, perhaps when qualitative data is insufficient to generalize. And so I have done qualitative focused um, studies on each one of these four purposes. And so in corroboration, I used it where I actually uh, corroborated perspectives and experiences around a particular phenomenon. Um, when I did one on completion, it was this idea um, that I had an intervention study 
that I wanted to make. And it's really interesting. And you've, we're seeing a lot of work in the health where you might have intervention studies, but the focus and the priority is actually given to the qualitative rather than, um, if I can, some of the clinical outcomes in, in some of the, the, the work that I've worked on and also worked with others on. In the explanation, um, this is a very common one to explain quantitative trends. And I often use it in order to find a particular population. And maybe it's a hard to reach population. Maybe I don't, maybe, um, you know, folks actually can't identify themselves. Maybe you actually have to do some sort of measures in order to find them. And then again, in the development, I think this is a really important place as we look at our measures in different lights, you know, and, and whether they're applicable to different populations. Because many of our measures were developed with a particular population in mind. Um, and so maybe this is a really lovely um, way where the interview uh, or a focus group or some sort of qualitative work um, can help uh, us understand where our measures are actually very limited and, and we can improve them if I can over time. So those are just four examples of uh, many, many others exist and we will continue on. So here's an illustrative example in, the, in, in my first one is uh, in this particular study, I privileged the student experiences. Uh, and the way that you can tell that I'm privileging that is that I'm talking about the use of a qualitative dominant crossover mixed methods uh, analysis uh, strategy. And I'm drawing upon three different data sources that help me to, to, to gain different perspectives. I've got classroom-based observations, so that's my teaching assistant. I've got uh, team meetings that are the instructional team, and I've got the student perspective in a student questionnaire. And, that's, and that questionnaire actually ended up being mixed. It had both qualitative and quantitative aspects to it. Uh, I used a mixed methods case study design in order to, as my frame, so those four points, um, just to remind you, map onto the four core characteristics. And that I frame the procedures within the newer theories of learning progression as inherently complex. So we can't just understand learning from what students um, they are embedded by their, you know, by and they're influenced by their interactions within the learning environment. So there's there's one way of looking at it. Go ahead, Stacy. The next uh, would be as well, and my mixing purpose. So this is actually from the paper, is that I talk about the need for completion that the purpose was to generate a comprehensive understanding of this intervention. Uh, and that this is in the learning environment. And if you go to the next one, I think it's important that we haven't lost this idea about what qualitative is. So when I looked at uh, John and, and my book on, 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 uh, on just qualitative case study, I want you to notice that in my purpose statement, I'm still following the things that we would expect. So for example, in red, I have the central phenomenon studied in my case study. Is this instructional strategy intervention? I, I'm still talking about the study context. It's within a higher learning environment within a particular class. And that the study participants are these you know, multiple perspectives with a priority given to the student, and that I'm using these other. So I think this is important that we are meeting both you know, what is, um, what is expected in the qualitative research as well as as what would be expected in a mixed methods guidance okay and so in to answer our question one if you want to know a little bit more i've given you charlene's great book there she's also got a great um chapter as i mentioned in that one handbook um, and we also, I thought uh, this, this new article uh, in quality and quantity was really interesting because it tells us why it's so hard to find qualitatively driven mixed methods research because we don't often talk about it explicitly. And then the last one is, is, is the book um, that does talk about, um, you know, it is in the mixed methods um, research, but you can apply a lot of what we're talking about here um, to that book as well. All right, next one. Take a moment and how does your study meet the core characteristics of qualitative focused mixed methods? What is your mixing purpose? So feel free to kind of take a moment and, and write down a few of your ideas. Um, and uh, at this time, then if you push it one more time, Stacey, you'll see uh, an idea pop up here. And oh, yeah. And so let's pause here. And while folks are, are maybe writing down, I'll answer a question or two. Okay, Cheryl, um, there are quite a few questions, so we're going to take a couple at a time and hopefully get through all of them by the end. Um, so let's start with 
Well, this might have been answered a little bit already, but when can you call it mixed methods and when can you not? Oh, fascinating. And so I do think that if you go back and look at those four characteristics, um, so, you know, do you have a design, you know, and we'll talk in our next question about designs, which is great. Um, and uh, so I think you do want to meet those four character, four char uh, core characteristics. Great. And then let's say, um, do you think that mixed methods are better for doctoral students rather than undergrad and master's students? Oh, that's a fascinating question. I grapple with this. Um, so I have started teaching, you know, and, and, I'm, and I'm advocating that we at least introduce the idea of mixed methods research in our undergraduate research courses so that folks know, I think if I can ideally, um, if you can set up to do one study, you know, um, in, in, in your master's and then the follow-up study in your, in your PhD, that's where I've seen it really work really well. Or you have to scale down, if I can, um, your doctoral work so that you can um, have both of them there. And so I do just want to mention that one of the challenges I see in, in, in the doctoral work, and I want to kind of see next week that I've already given um, the student this feedback, is that the, one of the challenges with mixed methods is that um, you can't you can't do uh, you only get one PhD if I can you know rather than uh, so whatever you're going to do is maybe you want to decrease the number of, of folks that are involved in your study or maybe you want to focus it just a little bit but if you're going to do a mixed method study uh, just feasibly um, but don't forget you can also use your doctoral work as a jumping off spot so for example in my own work. I really wanted to do a mixed method study for my doctoral work, but it didn't make sense because I needed to do almost like pre-qualitative work before I could do the mixed work that I wanted to do. So in my dissertation, it ended up being totally by accident, all qualitative, a qualitative case study. And then my program of research is mixed. And so I, so then my follow-up then, because I had thought about that, I could do then, and then, and then my, my doctoral work fit into my program of research that then started as a, as a mixed methods program of research. So always know that you can go back and forth between that. I still do qualitative studies, I do quantitative studies, and I do mixed method studies. And it's really important to go back to what the question is. All right, so let's go on to the question two, and then we'll come back to a couple more questions afterwards. So question two is, what will your qualitative focus mixed methods design look like? So designs convey the procedures, and we're finding in mixed methods that visuals uh, are, are really a lovely way of both feasibly conveying and also clearly conveying. So for example, in this one, this is the second illustrative example, um, we can make explicit these three decisions. So if you click once, um, Stacy, you'll see A come up, oh, okay? And so then right there, um, where you see the A come up on the screen, is it does make sense, the timing. It makes explicit the timing. So you'll see that this particular design is a sequential design. So a concurrent design is where both of uh, both of your uh, data this one is you can tell that I use the data collection in the quantitative to follow up with this. So this is more of a uh, of a compare and relate. And so what I would talk about this is if you notice with B points is the compare and relate. to understand this, but that I'm doing it in that um, that the Quan helped me to develop my qualitative interview. Now, do you notice here where, you, where if you click one more time, see, one of the lovely things about designs and, and these visuals is you can actually convey in a very subtle way. Did you notice here that where I use the word qual, it is capitalized? Well, that's a convention that it, that it demonstrates visually that it is a that that's the priority i'm giving the priority i'm choosing to give the priority to the qualitative um and that i'm using the quantitative in in, in, in another different way so what i hope you can see is that uh, a visual so i will often sketch out a visual and um and then write to it and that's really helpful if you go to the next slide 
So in practice, we might choose or adapt designs from existing typologies. So in uh, John and Vicky's recent uh, third edition, they talk about three core designs, and these are the convergent design, which is which is when they're coming together and you're and and you're going to be merging them in that. You have um, an explanatory sequential, which means uh, it, that's what what comes after each other, and your purpose is to explain. Um, now don't and then your exploratory is this idea. Now, what I love about in this recent uh, edition is that they're offering a little bit more, if I can, variance in terms of how we go about this. So one of the challenges that I have that, that students sometimes tell me, uh, and it was actually the impetus for writing my book on, on, on innovations, is this idea that I can't do my study because my study doesn't fit into a design typology. Well, you know, even even John and Vicky's typology is only one of many different typologies, um, and and I listed a couple of them on my reference list here in a moment that I'll talk about. But this one has been very very popular. Now here's what I think is really exciting, is I think these complex designs can very easily be considered qualitative focused designs. So if you had your experimental um, design and what we talked about is if we gave priority to the quantitative, uh, to the to the qualitative, is are qualitative uh, focused. Um, the case studies that I usually do usually are because I'm understanding a phenomenon. Then the other two are also the participatory social justice, and I think that lends itself beautifully to being qualitative focused, because when we're trying to understand and involve folks, and you're and you're trying to, to change the world, that we really we have to do it with a focus on 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 the experience, in my opinion. And many evaluation designs are. Other intersection designs that are emerging. We're seeing the the articles come out that are mixed methods action research or action research mixed methods. You know, this area. Uh, Tim Dutterman has done some great work in the um, grounded theory and mixed methods. And so what I talk about, it's one of the reasons why I'm working on this handbook um, on mixed methods designs is because I want to see, uh, you know, uh, if I can, greater diversity in the types of designs and more guidance for folks who are, you know, trying to get these things going. And so you can certainly have then those types of designs. So they're definitely coming and they're in the literature. We just kind of have to look for them. Okay. And so here's the illustrative example from the first one uh, that I talked about is that this is a mixed methods case study design. Um, if you notice in my diagram, you see the qual analysis. Uh, the qual is, is capitalized, which, which indicates, as I mentioned in the, in the convention of doing designs, that that's the priority in which I'm giving. You can tell here from my design that I have uh, three different data sources within each of the um, course offerings. Uh, and that this is actually, if I can, even a multiple case study design because I am comparing across three different terms of kind of collecting the data. The other thing that is really important is to notice where the points of integration can happen. They can happen at the design level. They can happen, and there's some great work um, being done here that's talking about um, you know, even kind of a more integrative um, mixed method designs. This again happens to be where I'm integrating after analysis at the more interpretation level. Um, and some folks would would say that that's on the you know if if you have a intensity of of, of integration in mixed methods, I think it's a great place for people to start. And so I always like to start if I can these types of introductories um, where this is a great place in. But then perhaps in the future. I actually want to do more mixing, maybe within at the case study level, uh, at the case level. So between those three data sets, perhaps I want to, and then and then and then um, do my comparison or my um, at.
And then here's some 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 resources. Uh, so we've got the the, the Cresswell and Vicky's uh, book uh, that I talked about. Um, Greg Guest has this great article. It really started um, the discussion about moving beyond typologies. Uh, Jan Morris has a great um, uh, article in here about uh, sampling and and reflexivity. And then this is another Tedley and Tashikori in the 2009, which I believe is being updated. Um, and in this, they have a typology of 32. And I would argue that the 32 do give us more diversity. They're just harder um, if I can um, maybe accessibility, you know. And then there are some great uh, uh, in vivo um, webinars that are actually talking about how do I now that I have a design, how do I you you know even manage my data within NVivo. All right, let's go to the next one. It's always where I think we're we're really well paced and we're we're quickly running out of time. So I'm just going to pause here um, and let folks. I, I think I'm going to skip the questions for a moment, Ali. I'm going to go to question three, and then we will have a um, a question there. Strain by the typologies, use them to your advantage. Sketch out what you want to do, and if your design happens to fit within a typology, then you can talk about having adapted this typology. So let's go to question three, if I can. Yeah. And then who will your folk, your qualitative focus mixed methods involve? And one of the things that I think is really important to be thinking about is that we have sometimes this assumption that qualitative expertise plus quantitative expertise will equal mixed methods expertise. If you click um, for me, it is not enough. So you do need some sort of mixed methods um, expertise in order to help you to do your qualitative focused mixed methods study. Now, I'm a firm believer that by doing, you know, certainly you can uh, begin I think it's important to know what you don't know when you start a study as well. So if I can, a better um, equation, uh, Stacy, if you can just click, is that mixed methods expertise plus relevant qualitative expertise plus relevant quantitative expertise and plus other relevant expertise. So let's talk briefly about what you mean by this. I mean that you want to have somebody in your, you know, either Doing a, a, a phenomenologically, you know, uh, focused mixed methods that, that that I would want somebody with some of that qualitative expertise, and then let's say I'm doing, I'm including maybe a survey design. So then I do want that type of quantitative expertise involved, and then let's say I'm doing it in the higher education content expertise. And people always ask me about um, about do I need to have expertise in my in, in the content area. And I say, well, I think on your team you do. And so I think uh, that that's important, that we can't do this type of research, particularly qualitative research, without having some of that, um, that understanding on your team. If you go to the next slide, and I think it's important that we begin to describe the capacity for this work. When I read um, funding proposals, In, in the example that, that I'm a sole author on, and I talk about my experiences as a mixed methods researcher, uh, you know, in my educational technology, which is the subject area in which the study was done, in higher education and in classroom assessment, provides the impetus for, for my desire to contribute to the mixed methods discourse um, around this. And so I think that that's important to put out there. And I think um, we're, we're beginning to see more and more folks who are describing and I think it builds credibility as well in your publications. If you go to the next one where I worked as a team, you will see uh, a statement that we actually have, you know, the team approach and kind of how and what each person brought. So um, the, the first author, Leah, was uh, trained as a social psychologist. She was very much the expert in motivational and quantitative research. And then I am the second education faculty member and I bring those kinds of ideas. So even though it's a mixed method study, I am I'm talking about the expertise that I bring. And then our third member was a doctoral student. And I think it's important for us, um, you know, to also experiences. And I'd love to see even a little bit more about
The other piece that I just wanted to make sure I mentioned, because we don't talk about this enough, is actually about not only who's on your team, but also who's involved as your participants. One of the things about mixed methods we're not, and we're beginning to talk a little bit more about, is this idea about what is the relationship among the samples in your different data sources. And so, uh, to identify what is your mixed sampling strategy. So you're gonna have strategy within your qualitative, like purposeful, uh, convenience, uh, you might have random, and within your quantitative, we have all the different stratified representation. So we wanna make those sampling as well explicit in our write-up. But we also wanna talk about, it's really about like, why can we mix these folks? The example of 50 you might use one of your, um, your your types of data to find. So for example, um, in the second illustrative example, we actually use the quantitative in order to find particular teachers that we wanted to ask more questions to. Or in the parallel is this idea about, about that there's some relationship between them. So for example, the students involved in this study uh, are related to the parents who are also involved. So the parents are related, I guess, parents of the students involved in our study. So even though we might have, but there's some sort of relationship between them. So uh, I think that that, if I can, a little plug about sampling is really important. We'll go to the next one. And then here's some resources that will help you. So I've got several um, articles here about how teams work together. And I've also got a couple of great articles here about um, sampling. And as you'll notice that some of them, there hasn't been as much work done. Uh, there's uh, the Collins one and the Tedley um, are kind of the two that I use in my own teaching about uh, typologies with samples. All right, so let's go to this one. Uh, who will your qualitative focus? How will you get the expertise that you need? And if I can, I'll... and jump in here quickly. I thought there was an um, interesting question on what can we do when the findings from qual and quant studies do not match or tell a cohesive story in the end? I'm referring to the MM design where both qual and quant studies examine the same um, research question. It is a great question. That has long been actually interesting to me. And it, it it's interesting. We sometimes talk about that as being divergent findings. I actually like to say that those are the interesting ones. I am always looking for where things don't match. And actually, I purposely put this in this second um, illustrative example, um, is that that's one of the things that, that, that we talk about in that, uh, in that study, is actually we're more interested in the places where, where, our, where the findings don't uh, map on if I can that they actually and so there's a whole literature and, and there is some guidance if you look up a uh, divergent you know uh, mixed methods and and I think that that's an area that is being um, if I can is growing um, because it's funny that we actually have this assumption that things should dive should converge when I actually think that that's where mixed methods can can play some really important um, perspectives the other thing that I want to mention is I've seen this do work. So for example, with very low incident populations that they really want to work on, but that, and, and, and that they have um, some measures that, that they can use, some, some clinical measures, um, and that only by doing a quality, by adding the qualitative, could they, if I can, sell this to a, a, a doctoral committee as being a viable study. So I do think that it's important to, to talk about the opportunities that um, are presented um, by these types of designs. And then I think we're just beginning to see um, some of the opportunities here. So let me go to my fourth question and then we'll come back and open up the floor. So the last one that I really wanna talk about is there's more and more emphasis on how will you represent the required evidence of integration. So integration should be permeating the whole, uh, when I talk about designs, I don't mean just at the beginning, I'm talking about implementation, representation, the whole bit. 
Um, I love uh, that there's a couple of great articles that were first started by, by, by Pat Baisley, that she talks about these metaphors. Um, and that I think metaphors of integration are powerful images. And other folks have also used them in their kind of writing. Uh, I talk about sometimes kind of the spiral idea. But in this, let's talk about um, three different ones just by using these. So when we talk about um, different intensities, So in this way, when you look at a write-up of a mixed method study, you might see, you know, maybe your typical um, uh, structure by you using your themes as your backbone, and then you would see where you have your, you know, your your rich description, and then maybe you're bringing in um, some quantitative measures. So for example, I just wrote up um, a, a mixed methods case study on um, on the COVID-19 response. Um, you know, here in Alberta using open access data. And so, for example, we were very much looking at the experiences, but we used like, you know, cases, we used, um, uh, you know, different quantitative, uh, you know, we did some text mining and looking at sentiment analysis. So those were our quantitative, um, so they don't have to, again, they're, they're not the priority, but that they certainly help us to understand the context, if I can, of what we're trying to describe. If we look at the second, um, we see weaving. And I think this idea about weaving is really interesting. And I think about that as being, and this is what Tim Gutterman and, and um, this, this article does a really nice job of, is it talks about weaving um, or actually like merging things. And so I think about that as being woven. And so what you might see here underneath each theme even in quality is you might see just a little bit more of a tight, um, fit between the qualitative and the quantitative, and just a little bit more of the storytelling um, that uh, that or or the. Integration at the data level, and so you will see, you know, a little bit more um, something new coming out of these kinds of understandings. And then the last one, the width, is what I, I, I think about that for blending. And so let's say for, if you, the purpose for your qualitative focus mixed methods was for exploration, that maybe what you're doing the, you know, if you think about what this is, is you're creating something new. Um, and I would actually say data transformations where you're changing the qualitative, you're qualitizing or you're quantitizing data. Uh, you might be looking for trends in different ways. I know in the new NVivo 12 um, webinar that I was watching that you can now do some, some sentiment analysis of your qualitative. So that's kind of, you know, if I can transforming and getting a different lens on some of that types of data. So you're actually creating something new. So that might be a little bit more, if I can, intense in that integration. If you go to the next, one, so in practice, you may show evidence of integration um, of the products of integration using a joint display. And so you, we're seeing a lot of great work and a lot of ingenuity. Uh, and some of this has to do with the different types of data that we're bringing together. I've seen really neat maps um, with different uh, data. Um, so this is, if I can, a more typical one where you actually do see um, the qualitative and the quantitative. I, I think it's important that you see um, that in the first column, you see mixed insight. So that's actually what um, I'm interpreting out of looking at the thematic categories across these three themes. So again, what we're trying to do is trying to show more representation about where, where, is, where are mixed insights coming um, and, and, and displaying uh, like we do in both qualitative and quantitative, but coming at this in a little different way. The second um, visual I want to show you here, if you go to the next one, is, is something I've been working a lot on, is how do we actually make explicit how we're deriving our mixed insights? So this is um, something that I've been working on, and it's about making the integration process the italicized small print, I'm talking about even 
what analyses I'm using. Then you're seeing, um, you know, where the thematic coming out of the class observations and the student. And so I'm actually showing where the mixed insights have come. from the thematic categories more pronounced and it actually maybe is showing that that's what I'm actually using as my backbone and that through the qualitative focus crossover I'm actually if I can mapping on um, the the quantitative um, understandings all right I know we're getting close to the rest of our time for the for the question four here is some uh, some some great resources I've talked about some of them already but uh, if you want to know more about integration in kind of mixed methods, I don't have any specific um, qualitative focus integration yet, if I can. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, um, and uh, I think I'm going to skip this one and we'll go to the last one and then we'll open up just for questions if we can. If you keep going, Stacy. So I do see lots of synergies. Um, one of the things I always like to caution is that software is, 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 um, is great, but you have to have I've used NVivo for producing, uh, you know, joint displays and, and different ways of representing things. I think Sage be improved if I can. finish the rest of the slides and then take questions at the end and yeah. if it's okay with you it's okay if we go over a little time but we'll sure. um go through uh so um ali if you want to talk a little bit more about the book sure i was just gonna say cheryl's already done a brilliant job of <laughs> plugging some good resources of her own as well as others um but if you want to learn available via the SAGE website and you're welcome to contact me if you have any questions but you can click that link directly and find out more on the SAGE website. Great, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about um, different options for InVivo. We can help you collect your data with InVivo integration, help you transcribe with InVivo transcription, help you manage and analyze in vivo collaboration and then enhance your learning with our, our trainings. Um, this is all in the handout we have made available. So it's been really fun and great and this is an example of an excellent webinar that uh, we partnered with uh, SAGE with to bring to you. So we have two more uh, in November and December and we're currently working on the spring series. So watch out for more information coming up. Uh, also, check out the NVivo podcast. Cheryl it will be in one soon. It will be um, published in the next couple months, and we're on all the major uh, platforms. So you can just actually, you know, uh, look up NVivo podcast, and it'll, it'll, you'll get to it. Uh, we did a virtual conference, but it's now on demand. So if you want access to all the content, just go to our website, and you can still join the conference. Uh, the community. So it'd be great if you'd like to join the community in the handout. This is a link to join. And at the end, there's a short webinar asking, um, I mean, survey that will ask if you want to join the community and I can send you information on how to do that. And you'll just get information on, about upcoming community events like this one. Um, so with that, uh, Cheryl, did you want me to put up the last poll just for fun or and while we, well, um, I'll have Ali at, think of, or look at some questions to ask you too while we have the poll up? Sure, that sounds great, thanks. Okay, I'll do that now. So just one more poll. And um, Ali, if you wanna ask some questions, I Sure. Um, Cheryl, I think a good one for everybody might be, what will a qualitative focused mixed methods research question look like? Um, how do we resolve the conflict between the inductive and deductive logic involved in qual and quant respectively? 
That is brilliant. And so, um, and, and it's interesting. I actually think that that's a place where we, uh, if you look um, even at a lot of published work, they don't actually even always have research questions in there. And I think that that's a great place. So a mixed methods question, uh, qualitative focus would, if I can, is, is it would keep that idea, just like the purpose statement that, that I had up there, of kind of qualitative um, focused, but it would also require, you would also suddenly have that, um, that, that that mixed method integration piece. So it might be something like, uh, to what extent, um, to what extent, um, you know, do the experiences of, let's say, students in my class, um, uh, students in uh, maybe one of the terms of class, um, you know, converge upon the students across all three terms. You know, that kind of an idea. Um, so it would have to be specific to, it would have to meet the um, case study idea as well as being, as demonstrating an emphasis on that, on, on, uh, and so that actually would have been a great fifth point to, con to kind of have on there too. So thank you for, 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 for raising that. And I'll just say the poll results. So 53% of people said, A, um, I plan to continue learning about qualitative and I can't read the rest of it. And, and then 43% said B and then 3% said C. Okay, great. So we were we were on track in terms of, of, of that this was being used both for kind of dipping your toes in as well as kind of getting practical tips if, if I can about moving forward. Do you wanna take one more question? I'd be happy to. Oh, this is pressure. I have let people know <laughs> though to contact either you or me directly if they want to follow up because we won't have time to get through everyone's. Um, but thinking about what might be a good general question for people, um, what are the most common mistakes that researchers make when analyzing and interpreting mixed methods data? Is underestimating how much time the analysis takes. Uh, and and particularly in a qualitative focused um, and, and uh, you know and so I think uh, so I would say that um, um, under you know and then also the other one is 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 not um, actually uh, not actually having evidence of integration and that's where you know if you're just writing up qual and quan separately then um, it would not fit um, uh, you know it would not meet what we're seeing as some of the quality standards of mixed methods. We really need to see, you know, what is it that you are generating that goes beyond um, the qualitative and quantitative separately? Great. Well, um, I think that was, that was like, we're getting great reviews on the webinar already. Everyone saying this was really helpful and really informative. So thank you so much, Cheryl. And thank you, Ali, for um, uh, partnering with me on these, this series. Uh, thank so you, every, Steve, yeah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, And um, we'll uh, be sending the recording in a few days. So you'll get that. Also uh, with the recording, the handout will be part of that too, if you didn't download it. And uh, like Ali said, um, she uh, is letting people know how to contact them because we had tons of great, great questions and we just couldn't get to all of them. But thank you for participating and thank you, Cheryl. Oh, thanks for having me. And and again, thanks everybody for coming and listening. And and I think there's lots of great work to be done here. So I really encourage you to to you know take the risk if I can and 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 get your feet wet and 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 do the qualitative mixed methods. I think it's an up and coming area. Excellent. So thank you very much, everyone. So we'll end the webinar and um, uh, stay safe and have a great rest of your week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.